this ain't the first time I've been up here. But I told my wife, I said, I don't know why I'm so nervous. I mean, I'm pure shaking, sweaty. I'm like, maybe it's because I haven't had any sleep in the last four or five days. Yeah. It's been like, uh, what we get, about six hours in the last three days? So you don't know what you're going to get tonight. <laughs> but she, she's a real encouragement. She says, just don't lay an egg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you know what you're in for if I've already got it. Just starting off, Danny leaves. Pastor wants me to pay him for saying all he did, but <laughs> sorry. But <laughs> and then I got my cheering section. I mean, what, what more do you need? I just need some more over on this side. At least look over here and somebody go. Anyway. Uh, nope, that's not the page. I, draw, I can't outsource such a mess. I got them out of the pew, and there goes my Bible and everything with it. So anyway, we're going to open up to Matthew didn't lose my nose, but I did drop everything else. It's Matthew 14. Uh, as you get in there, if you would, we'll stand. Uh, if I can ever find it. There we go. <clears throat> this is a very familiar passage. As a matter of fact, Pastor alluded to it earlier in, uh, in this morning on the message. I first thought he was going to go ahead and take off and do it. And I said, well, great. I don't have to preach now. You already got me covered. Uh, very familiar passage where Jesus is, uh, calls Peter out of the boat and Peter walks on the water. Uh, actually, I did this message years ago, but some things have changed. So as, uh, I guess everybody's there. We'll go ahead and read it and we'll get on with this. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 22, if I didn't tell you, in chapter 14 of Matthew. And straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee unto the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, Lord. I ask tonight, Lord, that it be not of me, but Lord, just use me to uh, get this message that you've given me, Lord, over the last several weeks. Father, that somebody here, it will do somebody some good, and your will will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. You You know, the hardest thing I found about preaching, even with kids, is getting the thing started. Well, kids, it's easy. You just yell at them and stuff because they're usually goofing off. But you guys aren't. I can't call out helpers, you know, slap you around or whatever. But this is actually the hardest part of this message is getting it started. Uh, as I was praying, I, I, I said that it's been several weeks. I had another message I wanted to do, but going to the revival over in Clinton, uh, and several other things, listening on the radio, I hear messages. And it seems I keep hearing this same thing, which I'm going to preach about. I'm not going to give you the title right now. I will later. I've got two. And it, it really uh, started convicting me. And I started looking back at this message and add some things to it. Uh, I love this, 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 this story in the Bible because it's, it's one that every time I read it, something new comes out of it. I'll hear something somewhere, and it'll, it'll just change something about that message. It's just a message where <clears throat> I'll give you a background, and I'll tell you about it. It's just, right before that, 
Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. And these disciples, these 12 men who had been with him for approximately two years at this point, they saw where he multiplied five loaves and two fishes, and when it was done, they took up 12 baskets of what was left over. You can't do the math. Five times two would never even equals 12. It was a miracle. It's something that never had happened before. And these disciples saw it. And they witnessed something so great. And just a few hours later, it's like they forgot who they saw do this great thing. Where later on, you know, we find out that Jesus sends them away in the ship to send them across the sea. And, of course, it's a bad storm. Jesus leaves them, and he meets them back on the ocean or on the sea or this lake or um, and he's walking out there to them. And I, I, a lot of times when I read these, I get animated. I start picturing what was really going on, what everybody looked like, everything. And, and a lot of times, I've been on the ferry. We've gone out to Ocracoke, and, you know, at nighttime, it's dark. I don't know if anybody's ever been on a ship in the middle of the night out where there's no light. It's dark, even with lights on the ship. And back then, of course, they didn't have lights on the ship. And it was the fourth watch, which was sometimes after 2 a.m. in the morning. They see Jesus, or they see something coming to them on the water. Of course, they get scared. And I look at this, and it says two places that Jesus immediately and straightway comforts them. Uh, one thing, I'm going to change gears here a little bit. Over the years, I've had many opportunities to be with a lot of past preachers who have come through here to go pick them up or have a chance to talk to them here and different places I've been. And a lot of times we, we talk about things about why churches aren't exploding. I mean, once if, if you really understood what we had in our hands, why, why, are we, why is there empty spaces in our church? And it seems like, you know, uh, a lot of the reasons are we just don't have the faith that Jesus talks about. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I could get off track real quick. And I like this. A lot of pastors or, or preachers I've heard preach, and I haven't heard all the messages ever on, taught on Peter, Peter, but everybody wants to talk about Peter, that he's such a, in, in, in real crude language, he's kind of a screw-up. He's always doing stuff, putting his foot in his mouth, this, that, and the other. And that's the way a lot of preachers present Peter when they talk about him. I mean, all the different things he did, like uh, when he denied Christ and all the things. But you've got to look at one thing that I really thought, saw in this message was that Peter was doing things nobody else would do. He, uh, many times was the only one doing anything. And I look out here at this story. Here's Peter on the boat with the other 12. Here comes Jesus, and when he realizes that it's Christ, he says, let me come on out to you. And I got thinking, what were the other ones doing? They saw the same thing. But Peter got out, and he did something no man in the history of the world ever did. I told the kids that, and I said, who else can walk on water? Well, I got a kid in, my, in June church. Brother Chris has got it now, I think. Oh, he knows people that have walked on the water. I think you know what I'm talking about. But I said, no, nobody has ever been able to do that. Nobody. But Peter walked on the water. Everybody wants to pick out, well, yeah, but he started to sink when he noticed the storm came on. He, he started to sink. He got his eyes off Christ. We know that. And he started to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus pulls him out and says, oh, you of little faith. I was thinking about those in the boat. Peter had a little faith, and he doubted, but he didn't say anything about them. They didn't have any. And a lot of times, we, I want to lay some little bit of groundwork here. In this story, I picture the water as impossible situations. It is. It's impossible for us to walk in water. I have tried it. I sat there and said, Lord, I trusted you. I know that you live in heaven. You can do anything, and you can strengthen me to do anything, and I've tried it. And that's all I've done was tried it, and I got very wet. But Peter was able to do that. And I said, wow. And 
And I was thinking about all the other times that Peter uh, got himself trouble. I was thinking about the time recently I was reading a book on, uh, uh, on should Christians uh, bear arms. You know, it's a big thing going on. We know about all that. But, you know, there's a part in there where Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Judas and the crowd came to get him. We know what he did. He pulled his sword out and sliced off a servant's ear, and Jesus put the ear back on. But he didn't condemn Peter for having the sword. He said those who live by the sword should perish by the sword. In other words, don't be offensive. He said put it back up into your sheath. Now, I got off on a tangent. I was thinking about that gun control thing today. There's a lot of stuff going on. And Jesus wasn't against it. He didn't tell them to throw it away, get rid of it, you don't need it. He said, just put it back up, don't use it right now. But anyway, but Peter was always, his heart was always in the right place. A lot of times he didn't do the right thing, but it was in the right place. But he was a very proactive person here. And I was thinking about all these things and trying to put this message together and how to get it started. And I'm still having a tough time, but we'll work through that real quick and I'll be on my way. Here we got the ocean. It's an impossible situation. And a lot of times we look at this message as Peter got to walk on the water. And because of his little faith, he failed. You know, as we go along, there's impossible situations which we're going to be, that we're going to be involved in, in our lives and different things. And, and we've got a choice, and I'll leave it up here, and I'll give you the title of the message. You're going to be one of two people. You're going to be the 11, or you're going to be Peter. You're going to take care of an impossible situation by getting out of the boat. My message is one thing. Two, two words, or uh, two phrases. You can walk on the water, but hey, you've got to get out of the boat. As I was saying earlier, I had a chance to talk to preachers over a long, well, I think it was a long time, five years seemed like forever. And they always say, you know, when uh, we, uh, he listens, they listen to different people in their churches and they're going through so many different things and, and, and he wonders why things aren't happening. Not every time does God answer your prayer. But they all had this common thread. It's most of the time these people won't do anything. They can't get through their impossible situation because they don't get out of the boat. Now, Man, my mind just went somewhere else. A lot of times the reason we quit church, I heard this from somebody in our church recently. It's really surprised me, about three weeks ago. The reason we quit church or lose faith or belief in Jesus is because we are not yet involved in God's work. He can't give you blessings when you do nothing. In this story, the impossible situations are beneath Christ. And we need to get our eyes on him so they can get beneath us too. I always wondered what those disciples were thinking when he came across there and Jesus went across there <clears throat> and he called Peter out. And Peter said, Lord, bid me to come unto you. Now, so I want to just cover a couple things real quick on what it's going to take for you to walk on the water. First of all, in this story, we find where Peter was the only one, of course, to get out of the boat, and the rest weren't willing to do anything. I started imagining, you know, like when things happen in a church, when somebody starts having an impossible situation, we say, oh, well, they can do it because they're a preacher. Oh, they're this, or they're that. This story, Peter was not a preacher. He was a fisherman. He was a common man. I was thinking, uh, Brother Phil told me, uh, I don't know if you, most of you have heard about it. He gave me permission to use him tonight about impossible situations. He uh, recently, he uh, went for a job interview which I've been praying, you know, because of his job. He's gone a lot of times on Sunday, and he really wants to be here. He misses going on the bus routes on Saturday and Sundays because of the job. And we've been praying that something would change. Well, the night of the wedding, 
he came up to me and says, I got to tell you this. He said, a company across the road from where he works at, the president of the company came to him and wants him to work for him. And he'd work with this guy personally. And what struck me was there was a lot of stuff going on the night of the wedding. I, I, my mind was a million miles away. And, and he was telling me, and I said, well, let me think about this. Let me think on this. So let it sink into my mind. But he told me, he says, man, just think three years ago, man, I was into drugs. I was a drunk. I had nothing to do with the Lord. Three short years later, this man's offered me an opportunity of a lifetime. And he said, the best part is, I have Sundays off. Amen. And I was like, okay. And I got thinking, now why would God take Phil Waters? I'm just picking on him tonight. He gave me permission. To go from this place, a man's not even saved, to three short years later, answering prayers and giving them something that a lot of us would love to have that opportunity you know why he started coming to church here and he says man I need to serve I can't sit back here and do nothing God saved me and look I've got to do something I can I can pick out several people and he says I'm gonna get out of the boat because God Christ is saying come He's decided not to be the 11, but be the 1. That's when God starts to work in those impossible situations. See, that's where he works the best, is in the impossible situations. Not with the everyday mundane things. He does work there, but he loves and specializes there because when it happens, you can't say, look what i done, because it's an impossible situation. Peter could have never walked on the water. If he saw Jesus and jumped down, so I can do that too. He went right to the bottom. And I'm sure those 11 who sat back and watched this happen were going, look, he can't do this. There's no way. Look, I'm not a scientist, but I know one thing. Uh, we sink when we hit water unless we know how to tread it. The storm's bad. We're going to sink and drown. We're not getting out. But Peter put all that mess behind him because he saw his Savior. First point, if you want to get <clears throat> over impossible situations in your life, first of all, you've got to get your eye on the Savior. You have to ask. Now, you're saying, well, we do. Right now, we've got two buses that sit out here that never move. I've been praying that we get two more captains, some more drivers. Some people would get a heart. I think about Brother Steve. Same kind of scenario. He could have sat up here on the road. He could have sat somewhere here every week. He could just get up in the choir. He said, no, you know what I'm going to do? We needed a bus captain. He says, I. He kept thinking about it. He was working the bus route, and I kept praying about it, and the Lord kept saying, talk to him. I don't know how many years you've been away, dry, sober, whatever you want to call it, to now. But if you look, you can say, how can God take me? From where I was to where he uses me in this shorter time. He took on a bus route, and I'm going to tell you something. Now, he's got a lot of good help. I'm not giving one person any bus route credit. But he got out of the boat. He said, I won't sit around no more. My Uncle John's been bringing me to church for years. He's been working on me, and now it's my turn to give back. He said, he came off one day, and I said, look, I've been thinking about something. You want to be a bus captain? He said, man, the Lord's been working on my heart. I'll do it. And he did it. He's still there. He stuck with it. He got out of the boat, and he said, I'm going to do it because Christ has come. He's calling every one of us, and I was thinking this was the funny part about this. You say, well, I've got to be called. Peter waited till Jesus called, but see, God's always calling. He's saying, come. He didn't hesitate, and he says, wait a minute, Peter, you really need to get together with the, the other 11 and get a committee going here, and let's figure out if you should walk out on this water. Uh, you need to get everything just right. I mean, you, you are acting up, and you have been uh, 
what should I say, you're a little rough around the corners. You need to get yourself polished before you come out here. No. He said, come right now. I'll take care of the rest. Impossible circumstances is where God works the best. When you take, and a lot of times we'll sit there and say, well, you know what, I'll pray about it. I've heard that for the last 11 years. Hey, man, we need some help on the bus. I'll pray about it. Uh, I'm just giving you a full warning. If I ask you about coming on the bus, never tell me that. That's just a very pansy way of saying I don't want to do it, and I just don't want to talk about it. Uh, Brother Cecil Horton, most of you don't remember him. Uh, Brother Huckabee and I kept cornering him about taking on the bus route, working in Super Church. And the first time he says, you know, I'll pray about that. And I said, really? When do you plan on getting back to me? Well, I have to pray about it. And I said, well, you know what? The Lord's telling us to tell you, so there's your answer. You know what he did. But we can't wait around like these other 11. So you have a choice. God's saying, come. We've got ministry. We've got, we got all these people out here that need people willing to do something. Yes, sir. This church, hey, I don't know what the percentage is. Probably about 80 or 20% of the people in here actually run ministries and work in ministries. And I'm not putting you down because some people just can't. But you ever wonder why that maybe you've been praying and nothing's happening? Maybe the Lord's not answering. You say, well, you know, the Lord doesn't always answer you. Maybe he's wanting you to do something first. Yes, sir. There's faith. I was always thinking about, you know, I said, Brother Phil and Brother Steve, I, I can go on and on. We could pick out people all night. But that's not what I'm here to do. I didn't come here to pull people out. I just asked Brother Phil if it was all right to do that, and he said it was good. But I think about the impossible situations in my life. I mean, I grew up a Catholic. I did everything the good Catholic's supposed to do. I was baptized as a baby, like I had something to do with that. I had first unholy communion. I had, they called it confirmation. I was even an altar boy. I did all that stuff. Man, and I sat back and looked at these priests, because I went to a Catholic school. And I said, man, they tell me they, they know God personally. And sit back and for years watch them have their Las Vegas day and watch a priest walk around with, with a shot of scotch or something and cigarettes, drinking like he's... And I kept thinking, there's no way I can do what he does to get to heaven. That's why I thought for years. It was an impossible place. I was going to go to a place called Purgatory. And I was going to have to sit there and wait for Mary to bail me out. That's what it was. One year, I remember in the summer, I was probably in the, I think, 7th or 8th grade. We came down here. My granddaddy was not a Catholic. He was a Methodist, but he was old Methodist. Read his Bible every day. And I remember asking him. <clears throat> One night, we got ready to go to bed, and he always went to bed first. And uh, in his bedroom, he'd get in there and he'd turn on that little lamp and open up his Bible and read for a period of time before he went to bed. I was like, what is he reading? And I asked him the next day, I said, Granddad, was that your Bible you were reading? He says, yeah. The only thing Bibles were for was to hold the coffee table down in our living room. Or you put it up there and you put all these statues around. My mom had Mary and had all this other stuff around. I was like, you don't read that thing. He says, yeah, it's God talking to you. Talk about confused. And then a couple of years later, uh, no, actually it's that school year later, the head priest of our whole church had to get called because when I was in first through eighth grade, there was always two classes. There was two first, second, third, all the way through eighth. And the boy in this other eighth grade class had done something so bad that our English teacher called, but the nun who was the principal couldn't handle it, called the head priest in, a guy named Miglarini. I won't call him Father Miglarini because he wasn't a father. He came in. He was an Italian guy. He was huge. Bald, had a little bit of white hair around here. He came in. He was the same one we had seen smoking and drinking. He was, he was, he was good for that. 
He said, all good Italians drink. And he came in there and he cussed that boy out. I never heard some language like I did that day. And that flashed back to me. I can't do what they're doing. I, I'll never get to have it, it just ruined every concept of ever, if I died, I don't know where I'd go. It ruined it. And so years went on by, and the little old man I was working up in Cary, I probably told you before, <clears throat> he looked like Mike Dick of the Chicago Bears. I don't know if some of you probably don't know who I'm talking about. But he was the roughest, toughest looking guy in the world. Walked up to me, Justin was only about a month old, and he says, if you died today, would you know you're going to heaven? I said, what? I heard one preaching message the week before, and I said, what? He says, you know that little boy of yours, a month old, if you both died today, he'd go to heaven, you'd go to hell. He'd forget who you were. I didn't know I was on the boat, and the storms were raging, and it was Christ coming, and he was calling, come. And for a week, I wouldn't answer that man's question. He gave me a track. I put it on my desk in my office. As a matter of fact, the girl that worked in there also, who was the clean lady, she took it. So I was really a mess because every day he asked me, hey, you read that track yet? And I said, what track? Oh, oh, yeah, I'm getting ready to. I didn't even know where it was. But at the end of the week, I remember Thursday night coming home. I lived in, I worked in Raleigh, or Cary, and I lived over in Dudley. Every night I come home, I think about, I don't talk to him tomorrow. Well, that Thursday night, I was so convicted, I said, tomorrow I'm going to get saved, Karen. Went to work, he wasn't there no more. God had given me four chances all week. And I kept putting them off. I wouldn't get out of the boat. And then when I wanted to, he wasn't there. So that day I come home, she could tell you it was a Friday, April 27th, 1990. The trailer still sits there in that trailer park, same one. I cried all the way home. I drove slow so I wouldn't get killed. I mean, I, it was, it was bad. I come home, I came in the house, I was down, I was like, I blew my chance going to heaven. That was on mine. I don't know if I said that to her, but I told her, I said, Ray didn't come to work today. He was finished the job Thursday night. He wasn't coming back. And Karen said, well, what about the preacher who just preached? It was Johnny Sasser of the Amos Baptist. Why don't you call him? I said, good idea. But before I had picked up the phone, it rang. It was him. He wanted to come see us that night. And I said, come on. He said it was the easiest person he ever saved in his life. I was sitting there waiting. I was like, yeah, 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 come on. So we got down got it done. But that was... And most people don't realize when you get saved, that's an impossible situation that God just lets you walk on the water over. There's no way me and you can get ourselves into heaven. If you think about it, you go back to, what's it, uh, Revelation. I saw this day when Brother John was doing Sunday school. Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and he... And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, let me ask you something. Do you fall into one of those categories there in verse 8? You ever lied? You're a liar. I looked at that, and I saw it today, and I said, you know what? That's us. But Jesus walked across that water and said, come. Every one of us. And we had the opportunity to say no or yes. I, I blew it four times. He gave me that fifth time. And I was able to walk across that water and I met him and was saved. See, he specialized in the impossible. I was a Catholic kid. My mind was so messed up with all that nonsense, I couldn't tell you upside down how to get to heaven. Matter of fact, if you want to have fun, find a Catholic priest and ask them how you get to heaven. It really is fun because they'll come up. You can go to this one, then you can go to this one. They'll all give you different answers. and they'll, they'll come out with all these. I mean, if they had to list them, man, they'd be pages. They don't know. And that's where I was, and it was an impossible situation. When I look back, 
Why did God do that? And then on top of that, He allowed me to be work on His bus. Yes, and I'm not going to get into all that. That's a, that's a message within itself about the buses. And then allow me to be a bus director of all people. I'm thinking, me? God, that's a big responsibility for an old Catholic kid that didn't believe much in nothing. But he says, no, I specialize in the impossible. And that's where he wants to work. So you can walk on the water, but you've got to do a couple things. And there's three things I saw here in this scripture that you've got to do to be able to walk on the water. First, you have to receive instruction. Peter asked, he got instruction, come. There was nothing to it. Just come on out. Get out of the boat. And Jesus didn't have to bid him and didn't have to work to tell him what to do. He didn't tell him, hey, look, this is what you got to do. You got to lift your left leg over the side. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Your other one, throw the rope down. Yes, yes, climb, climb down. Yeah. Now turn this way. He just said, come. And he did. See, a lot of times we want God to give us the perfect instruction. I'm not going to work that bus route. I don't know if I want to work on that bus. Uh, I'm not ready for it. What do I need to do? Do I need to get this done, that done? Do I have to have all this? No. Come. We'll put you to work. Hey, Sunday school teachers. They need Sunday school teachers. Our church growing, they need to split Sunday, Sunday school te- classes. Have you been down some of them? Classes are packed full. We need to split them. We need some Sunday school teachers. Come. Get out of the boat. I'm going to tell you something. Don't get out of the boat if he's not telling you to. If I can tell you this one, all the ministries around here, he's already told us to. He tells us every time somebody gets in his pulpit. Oh, that's the first one. Sorry. See, it's just like with the, here's a good example. In Acts 8, 31, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, we know the story. The Ethiopian was reading the Bible, didn't understand it. Philip was back there, and God sent his angels, gave him instructions. Hey, hey, go. And meet this man and tell him all he needs to know. He didn't wait around for a committee to figure out if he needed to go. He ran to it. And, of course, we know the story. He arose and went. In Acts 6, or 9, 6, about Saul, when God told him to go, start the church, he went. He went. How about Naaman? This is a good story. You know the story of Naaman and the leper? When he was a leper, God told him to go into the Jordan, the muddy, I think it was the Jordan. Maybe I got the wrong river. The Jordan? I got to go to the expert over there. Jordan. A muddy river to get clean. Dip yourself seven times. On the seventh time, you'll be cleansed. He did. And he was. See, when God tells you to do something, just do it. He's calling all of us to be here. You have to react immediately. Now, I just lost my page. Just like in this story, Peter, when Jesus spoke to him straight away, he went. We also find where Peter started to sink, Jesus immediately pulled him out. See, God never leaves you hanging. When he calls you to do something, do it. The best thing you can do is get out of the boat. Don't wait around. Next thing you need to do is to review your inspiration. Don't forget who you went out on the water for. See, a lot of times we do it for ourselves. He says, you go to Jesus. See, Peter, if he had kept his eyes on Jesus, he would have never sank. And I got to thinking, what happens if all 11 had gotten out of that boat? See, because the devil was throwing up this storm to get your eyes off of him. He does it every time. Every time, I was thinking about the Thurstons, I wonder what they're going through that Satan is trying to do to keep their eyes off of putting their trust into him. Or anybody. But he did. He threw up a storm. And that's what got Peter's eyes off of Jesus. He all of a sudden realized, whoa, there's this bad storm. And I'm in the middle of it. And I'm walking on water. He got his eyes off of God. 
you got to keep your eyes on your... And I was thinking about, how about if all 11 had gotten out of that boat with him? That's something to think about, what would have happened. I guarantee you the storm would have been nothing. Because, see, a lot of times in church, when somebody steps out on faith and does something, there's always people going to ridicule you. I was told I couldn't be the bus captain. I didn't have enough smarts to do that. When I did it the first time, I talked to Pastor Warren. It wasn't him. Somebody else told me, you don't need to be a bus director. That's what it was. You can't handle it. I said, it wasn't me. I didn't ask for this job. So I guess he's going to take care of it. If it was up to me, I'd want to quit. I want to tell you something. Getting up at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning to get out of here is not fun. A lot of times, especially when you're working all night, you get home late. There's a lot of reasons not to come work on the bus. It's not fun when your bus breaks down or your radiator's leaking, you got to pull it out. I don't know if anybody was in here when we pulled the last one. I think Brother Mike was. Air compressors breaking off and falling off, working on those. It's not fun. Oh, there's a lot of other things I'd rather be doing. But if you get your eyes off of Christ, it's easy to quit. Remember I said that earlier. The reason we quit church is because we're not watching him. We get in the ministry and it doesn't work the way we want to or we got to get uncomfortable. It's because we're not watching him. We're looking at ourselves and, and the storm. And the devil's thrown that up in our face. And most of the time, the circumstances look much worse than they really are. Because the devil's a liar. He's good at the smoke and mirrors. Because, see, Stephen faced impossible circumstances. Even death. In Acts 7.55, when they were throwing stones at him, he never once got his eyes off of Jesus. The Bible records that he looked into heaven. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. I want to tell you something. When you do something for Christ, the stones are coming. When you get out of the boat, I can imagine the other 11 going, look at him, who's he think he is? Old stupid fisherman. He knows he can't walk on the water. What's he going to do? He can't even swim. He's going right to the bottom. That's what happens when you get out of your boat. When Stephen stood up and looked into heaven, he saw Christ the whole time and they put him to sleep. They didn't say he was murdered, he was beaten half to No, and he slept. He saw the glory of God, and that was all there was to it. He kept his eyes. He kept his inspiration fixed upon. Look for Jesus. There's another part of this. I don't want to, I'm going to skip over that. That's a whole other message. Peter believed in his Savior. He got up out of that boat and walked. Didn't ask permission from the other folks. He went. Jesus said, come. All things are possible with God. Peers also do the impossible. See, when we get out and go soul winning or go work on a bus ministry and you bring those kids in because, see, it's an impossible situation with them because most of the time, nobody knows where they live. They live in these faraway places. Uh, I know the, the Auberson route, they go into some places. I remember when I first started with GL, he took me down places I didn't think there was even roads for, and we picked up kids. Some of the kids still coming. We have an opportunity to allow somebody else to walk on the water. When you go soul winning, you're doing something, you're going to see only God, wow, sound like I'm in a tunnel, work in their lives. When you give somebody the gospel plan, yes, they're sitting in a boat saying, I wish I could get out of this boat, but I'll drown. And Jesus says, come on, you give them that. See, they're on their way to hell. And when you're able to stand... Before them, it says, come with me. 
let's go. And you put them on that bus and you bring them here. And some Sunday school teacher who has studied all week and has prayed over and gets a new kid. I'm going to tell you what joy is. I don't know what Peter felt when he walked on that water. But I think a close feeling is when you lead somebody to Christ. When you take them right to them. And they're saying, wait a minute. I can go to heaven. I can walk across this water. Yeah. Just trust them. I don't know how many times I think uh, we've probably led more than 500 kids to Christ through junior church in the last 11 years. Not me, but him. But every time you do, it's like walking on water. And most time, most people in churches are going to sit in a boat and watch others do it. Aren't you tired of that? I hate it. I hate it when pastor said, hey, I'm going to let Brother Chris do June church every other month. I was first like, okay. And then I came and sat down like, I can't stand it. I feel like i got to be back there. I'm glad he's doing it. I'm glad other people are getting involved now. But there's no greater feeling to lead a kid to Christ. Say, look, hey. Nobody else in this world has ever been to your house before, have they? Uh Uh-uh. You came and picked me up. Yeah. Now, let me tell you about one day. And you take them across that water. You you lead them out of the boat. Yes, sir. And they accept Christ. You got to get out of the boat, folks. Jesus sounds like he's criticizing Peter. Oh, you of little faith. Why'd you doubt? He didn't say nothing to the other ones. Hey, Peter's the same one that preached to 3,000, or preached to 3,000, they all got saved. On that day of Pentecost. It wasn't the others. Peter's the one that most people want to meet when they get to heaven. And a lot of people are going to say, yeah, I want to meet him because he's just like me. And you get to heaven, he's going to say, man, you didn't do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you were one of the other ones who sat in the boat and criticized me. Yeah. So tonight I ask, hey, that seat's comfortable in that boat. And it's cushiony. And when you leave, you can go home and come back on Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night. I'm telling you, it's boring. It's when you get involved it gets exciting. Church is probably the most exciting place in the world. You get involved in the ministry, and you can ask some people who've been doing it for a while. I can tell you some stories. <laughs> it gets real exciting sometimes. I asked Brother Phil about, uh, what was his name? Reached up. Yeah. You had to be there. I got to hear about it. I wasn't there, but I'm telling you, sitting in the Okay, I'll leave. Amen. What are you amen him for? But really. It is. I'm quitting. Look. Whole thing is, get out of the boat. Amen. Quit sitting around getting wet by the waves that are flashing all around you. That's right. It's <laughs> come on. We got buses sitting out there, have nobody to drive them, nobody to fill them. I'm gonna hate stand before the Lord, and he's gonna say, "Yeah, two buses." Hey, let me show you some kids. Let me show you some families over here that never got picked up. Get out of the boat. Quit sitting there and watching somebody else get out. Now, I know there's some people that can't get out. And we got folks in here, some people, they can't, but they help us another way to keep them buses running. They help other ministries keep going. But for you, you young guys and ladies, you're just going to sit there. I, I'm, I just hate to see you one day when we get to heaven. God says, what were you doing? I had my seat. God's going to say, I told you to get out of the boat. 
Let's pray.